no problem. Awesome. So, Jay, I want to go right back. I want to start off by asking you a little bit about where your love for cinema first came from. Hmm. Um, well, my parents rented a lot of films, so I, I saw a lot of movies as a kid, and they didn't... I, I think maybe this was the case with a lot of kids in, in the 80s, but they didn't really hold back when it came to exposing me to uh, a lot of genre cinema and, you know, horror films and whatever else. And I I remember, and this seems weirdly like maybe a cliched answer right now, but um, John Carpenter, I remember his, we would rent his films over and over, and at the time I didn't really recognize, you know, that there was a, a director behind these things and someone who crafted these films and made these decisions. And, um, the, the, the moment that I realized that was seeing, you know, films like Prince of Darkness and they live and big trouble in little China and seeing the same fonts and the same type of music and some of the same actors and some of the ways in which he composes shots. And, and I think that is kind of the moment where I realized that there was, this sort of language behind the movies and um, kind of pushed me towards wanting to learn more about that and eventually wanting to become a filmmaker. Uh, So, and now John Carpenter has had this amazing resurgence and is finally getting the, uh, the credit he deserves. So I was uh, it's, it's great to see that. Definitely. And were you like me, did you find yourself going down rabbit holes when you were in video libraries as a kid because i was like you my parents would just hire whatever was new whatever was genre and i'd watch it and then i'd find myself thinking oh i want to watch more of that director or i want to watch more of that actor so the next time i went back i would try and find their films was that something that you went through too yeah for sure i mean um whether it be you know favorite actors or favorite directors um also, a little bit later, working at a video store in my teenage, late teenage years and deciding to try to go through the entire horror section alphabetically and, <laughs> um, you know, seeking out weird... I, I remember driving... I live in Toronto now, but at the time I was um, about an hour away and coming up here with some friends and buying Evil Dead, the Evil Dead on Laserdisc for like a hundred and twenty (laughs) dollars and at the time it was like you could not find anything like this anywhere and now everything everything is accessible um in in various editions so yeah it was always trying to seek out weird and um exciting films for sure yeah and i worked in a video library too and i know one of the advantages of that was you quite often got to purchase the x rentals that sometimes hadn't been released for sale normally as well yeah 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 that was that was definitely a a bonus and obviously getting free rentals helped so. yeah <laughs> so jay tell us a little bit about where your idea came about for for cursed films was it something that had always intrigued you that that folklore or stories that that circulated around certain films I mean, it, it always intrigued me that <clears throat> this series was brought to me um, by Shudder, like not not exclusively to me, but, you know, uh, uh, Owen Shiflett, who was at Shudder at the time, uh, is a friend of mine, and he knew that I was interested in these kinds of stories and uh, had seen my previous work and thought I would be a good fit. And then I basically pitched my interpretation on what, a show about cursed films would be and i think part of that came from um i had made a short documentary before season one of cursed films about a a tornado that hit a a drive-in uh theater in my hometown and the story was that it hit the drive-in while twister was playing and that the screen tore down and that it actually hit the screen during the scene in the movie when a drive-in theater is hit by a tornado and you know it was just this local urban legend and i did a a short film looking at that legend and 
how much truth there was to it and and why people were so interested in it. And it feels like that kind of looking back at it now was maybe a little bit of a um, proto cursed films like short. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, it's I've always been interested in these these stories, especially uh, making of stories. I lo- I love watching making of documentaries and even if there's no curses or or you know anything bad happening just the process interests me so when you first became involved with cursed films did you have much of a say on what films you actually explored or had that already been worked out for you there was a a, like a very basic pitch deck kind of with some films listed and um i think I'm trying to remember remember now, but there were some that were obvious, like Poltergeist and The Exorcist, and I, I think it was a conversation about a list of like ten or fifteen potentials, and then we just all narrowed it down to the five that we landed on in uh, season one. So it was a, a conversation had amongst us based on a, a bigger list. Yeah, now I've got the list in front of me for season two, but my listeners don't know that yet. Um, Tell us about some of the films that they can expect to see explored in season two. Yeah, so we, our first episode is The Wizard Wizard of Oz, which has a lot of stories connected to it that people have told for years and years, and it's kind of our horror-adjacent film, even though... A lot of people who grew up watching The Wizard of Oz, terrified by the Wicked Witch and the Flying Monkeys. and So there are certainly horror elements to the story, but um, a lot of strange things connected to that film. And maybe some things that aren't so strange, but can be very easily explained by just um, the, the period in which the film was made. <laughs> yep. Not a lot of considerations for the health and safety of the crew. Um, And we, the second episode is Rosemary's Baby, which uh, has, it's an interesting one because a lot of the stories connected to that film happened after the film was released. And a big part of that story is just the, the, uh, you know, the kind of temperature of the time, uh, 1968 and 69 in Los Angeles, um, a very, strange violent period in time that ended with uh of course the the manson murder so that that's part of the story that we tell um there is the serpent and the rainbow which uh brings the our story to haiti uh the the crew wes craven and everyone involved with the film bill pullman kathy tyson all went to haiti to shoot this film and basically realized that the con- it was a lot tougher filming in Haiti than they thought it would be. Um, and there's Stalker, which is kind of the the uh, sort of more esoteric odd man out of the bunch. Um, it's a, a Russian, kind of a Russian art film from 1980 with sci-fi elements directed by Andrei Tarkovsky. And the film is amazing. I, I'm excited to include it because I feel like maybe some people who haven't seen it will be interested in checking it out. But um, the stories connected to the making of it are are just as interesting. And there are elements of the story that have strange connections to Chernobyl. And we actually traveled to Chernobyl to do some filming for this episode, which was an amazing experience. And finally, Cannibal Holocaust, which is just... Um, you know, a notorious film <laughs> for uh, many reasons and um, really looks at the, the conditions, the, the, you know, in which the film was made. And we had a nice long interview with Ruggiero Diodato, the director of the film. And it, it's just uh, 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 breaking down, I guess, the fascination with this film in terms of it being uh, – uh, a bad object you know it's like the video nasties the film that everyone would talk about and share tapes of 
uh, this legendary film that, you know, you were almost testing your might sitting through it, um, exploring how that movie kind of broke through that barrier of blurring the lines between reality and cinema. Yeah. So when you first start exploring a film, how difficult is it to work out what is fact and what is fiction? Because we all go along to cinemas like the, the Asta here in Melbourne where they show classic films and then you just listen to the conversations in the lobby afterwards and you hear everybody has a different story about the film. How do you go about working out what is fact and what is fiction? Well, it's it's not really something I'm concerned with because the, the, the show isn't necessarily setting out to debunk anything and the show isn't claiming that these films are cursed the show is just about films that have this reputation. So yeah. it's really about asking that question to the people I'm interviewing. Yeah. You know, wh- why do they think that this was real? Why do they believe this? And getting them to share their perspective. It's not as much of an investigatory experience rather than a um, more character-driven, you know, like this is the experience this crew had on this shoot and these stories have lived on in, uh, you know, pop culture and how does that interface with what actually happened to these people in reality? So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of approaching it from more of a observational, purely documentary perspective. Awesome. Well, Jay, we are right out of time. So just to finish off, what would you like to say to everybody out there who's about to sit down and watch the new season of cursed films on shutter? Uh, I would like to say, I obviously I hope you enjoy the <laughs> the show, and um, <clears throat> thank you for watching. But also, I, I'm hoping that people meet some some interesting characters in this series that maybe they would not have met without sitting down to watch this show. And you know, the, I, I hope we found some corners of these stories that were a little less traveled and maybe might surprise even the hardcore fans of some of these movies.